everyone. My name is Haley Elizabeth, and if you don't know who I am, this is my podcast called Behind You, where once a week I sit down and talk about a true crime case ranging from all things true crime, from murder, disappearances, cults, to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're into any of that, you can subscribe on the YouTube channel and watch the visual version every Wednesday, or you can tune into the audio version on Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts every Tuesday. Now, if you're watching on the visual version, you can probably see that the background is different. Um, yes, I did change my room around. Um, I'm a Gemini, so this happens quite frequently. This is going to be gone. This whole situation is going to be gone. That situation up there, um my harry potter lego sets that's not going anywhere sorry about it but yeah i plan on doing some really cool things with this corner of the room so stay tuned for that today we are going to be talking about the case of yana cassian and there is a lot to get through with this case so let's just get right into it blake libel was born on may 8th of 1981 in toronto ontario canada he grew up with his father lauren his mother eleanor and his brother cody and blake would be described as as definitely a neptism baby if you guys don't know what a neptism baby is they're basically babies that are born into fame and wealth and that's exactly what Blake was born into Blake's father Lorne was a very famous real estate agent he was also a part of the Motorsport Hall of Fame in Canada and sailed for Canada in the 1976 Summer Olympics as for his mother Eleanor she was an heiress to many fortunes thanks to her father's many patents for Al Rose products and even besides his parents like the fame of his family extended even out to his aunt um he had an aunt that was a broadcast journalist for many of the summer olympics so blake and cody being born into a family like this that already had lots of fame and wealth right off the bat they kind of just had a lot of options from birth of what they wanted to do and when blake was very young that is when eleanor his mother um her her father had died, so that would be Blake's grandfather, and Eleanor had inherited $12 million from her father's death. Shortly after this, Eleanor's father passing away, that is when Lorne and Eleanor actually got into a divorce, and so through this divorce, Blake went to go live with his mother, and Cody went to go live with his father, and since the divorce, Lorne, the father, went on to be that, like, stereotypical old white rich dude that dates all these extremely young women and has parties with only young people. Since Blake lived separately from his father, as Blake grew up, he felt like his father really wasn't supporting him financially anymore. Lauren kind of just supported his son Cody and favorited him over Blake. And so due to this, Cody ended up growing up to have a very successful career in real estate, similar to his father. He was very, very big into real estate and he was really good at it, selling like million dollar homes. He even had a million dollar home himself that he ended up selling to Katy Perry for $18 million in Beverly Hills. He also bought Reba McIntyre's home for $25 million, making him the youngest homeowner in Beverly Park history. He was also the youngest person to own a Ferrari Enzo. And so real estate wasn't his only thing though like he wasn't purely just making money off of real estate he also had a bunch of side businesses as well such as a record label he would frequently go to a lot of very exclusive nightclubs and poker clubs like the type of clubs that you have to be an a-list celebrity to get into also did an article with motortrend.com called road tripping with cody libel and it was basically an article talking about cody's cars his home and how he's doing it all at a young age there is a spotlight on Cody everyone's gonna also be looking at Blake as well because that's his brother and so as for Blake he really wasn't doing that well Blake had big dreams of becoming a screenwriter and director and the best place to get into big feature films is Hollywood so in 2004 he moved to Hollywood California and even though he was out on his own he would still receive 
receive a specific allowance from his mom every month just to keep him afloat and pay for like his rent, his food, his clothes. And then two years later in 2006, that is when Blake met a woman by the name of Amanda Braun. Amanda Braun was a model and actress and Amanda at the time had just recently got out of a pretty bad relationship. But it was said that as soon as they met each other, they immediately hit it off and started dating. In 2008, four years after moving to California, Blake started to get a couple of positions in the film industry. He was a creative consultant, storyboard supervisor, and animated a couple of episodes of a show called Spaceballs, the animated series. This show wasn't that big of a success, but it did, you know, make it on Blake's resume. It was just kind of something for him to do. And as I said, since he was a screenwriter, he attempted at making one of his screenwritings visual, but not in a movie, but a comic book. So that is when he made his very first comic book called United Free World. But again, he had talked about United Free World at Comic-Con and things like that, but it really wasn't, you know, catastrophic to his career. So then in 2009, when he realized that screenwriting was a very competitive industry, it's not something he wanted to do anymore, he decided to shift his focus over to directing. And so in 2009, he made his very first film called Bald, which again was not that big of a success. I feel like you can really tell the type of personality that Blake has just simply by reading the description of this movie because it was written and directed by him. So this is the actual description of the movie that I found on Amazon. Brush up on hot girls and easy money in this raunchy adventure that will have you falling out of your chair with laughter. Andrew Wood is a horny college student and he's afraid his receding hairline will cut back on his sex life. To help with his hair transplant, Andrew's roommate, Max, starts a sexy, bare-all internet website featuring the most attractive girls in school. The website is wildly successful, but when the girls' parents discover what their daughters are up to, it's a war between generations. That is embarrassing. That is embarrassing and gross. I feel like just from that description alone, you can totally tell the type of guy that Blake is. He seems very cocky, very entitled. He seems to treat women like objects. So as I said, um, Bald wasn't that big of a success, which... I don't understand why. In 2010, that is when Blake continued to make comic books and he actually worked on a comic book called Syndrome with his two friends, Daniel Quantz and RJ Ryan. It was from the description said to be a mix between The Truman Show and Seven. I tried looking up this book on Amazon and this book right now goes for $134. So despite that disgusting price, I feel like the context of the book is very sinister and I do want to mention it because it is something that we are going to be circling back to later on when I start mentioning the crime. Syndrome was written on the book to be created by Blake Libel. In the book, it is about this doctor who gets a group full of actors to live in a fake town, sort of Truman Show style, and the only one person that won't be in on it is a serial killer. This doctor will take a serial killer, wipe his memory clean, and place him into this fake town and monitor his behavior to see if murdering people or evil tendencies is something that is developed through social cues or mental cues. The co-writers on this novel, Daniel and RJ, recall afterwards a bunch of really weird things that Blake did when they were making this story. They said that Blake went through a phase where he was really, really deep into serial killers and he kept on saying that he was looking up all of these really concerning things because it was for the book, but they got the feeling that it wasn't just for the book and it was purely just for Blake's 
curiosity and one of the things that he would look into was how to drain a human body of all of its blood. One of the co-writers, Ryan, actually recalls a specific incident where Blake had took Ryan's hands and jerked them above his own head to demonstrate how a body could be drained of its fluid if they were to be placed upside down. It was very clear that Blake had genuine interest in things like this, which made creating the book very scary. And the people being killed in this novel is always women. And every time it shows a woman's dead body, that body is always naked, which I think is so disgusting. There are so many graphic pictures of just naked women. There's this one photo, this naked woman's body being hung upside down and being drained of its fluid. There's this other part of the novel where there's a woman lying on the bed with her head cut off. I just found that part to be very, very disturbing that every single dead body that was featured in this book was always naked women. And in the beginning of the Syndrome book, there is an author's note. And as I said, since Blake was the author, this is what he put as his author's note. He said, quote, if you were gorgeous and running out of money, what would you do? If you spent your whole life mastering your craft and nothing else, what would you do? If you loved hurting things, what would you do? And I feel like a very key word of that last sentence, if you loved hurting things, what would you do, is the word things. And I think that's very important because as I said throughout the book, the killers of the story are only murdering women. So it kind of makes you think that Blake purely just sees these women as things and not people. He could have easily said, if you loved hurting people, what would you do? But instead, he describes them as things things. So after the release of this comic book, it did not go very far. It was kind of a flop similar to all of his other movies and comic books and so that is when he started to just move on to his next project and he was actually pitching this script for a movie called Psycho Pomp with his co-writers Hilary Shore and Lawrence Longo. Psycho Pomp was essentially about a masked murderer that cuts off the heads of villains and posts his crimes to YouTube. The script was described to be, quote, having tones similar to A Clockwork Orange and The Dark Knight. Now, the people who reviewed the screenwriting, however, absolutely hated it. They felt like the script barely had a storyline and it was essentially just 90% torture porn and 10% actual story. It was just sex scenes on every single page. So again, it really just shows you how Blake is using screenwriting as a way to express his sexual fantasies, but making it somewhat socially acceptable to be expressing those things. Since his script was so graphic, no one wanted to pick up the script, so once again, Blake's career was just sort of at a standstill. He wasn't getting any new jobs, he wasn't making his big break, and then the following year in 2011, that is when Blake's mother Eleanor had unfortunately passed away due to brain cancer. Now, Eleanor's death took a really big hit for Blake because, as I said, Blake grew up with his mother. All he really knew was his mother. He never really talked to his father. His entire life was his mother, and so the passing of his mother really affected Blake, and it made him kind of dig deeper into his darker fantasies because he was just going on a spiral. Shortly after his mother's death, though, that is when Amanda and Blake actually ended up getting married and then shortly after they got married, Amanda grew pregnant with a son. After Amanda had her and Blake's son, that is when they moved into Blake's Beverly Hills mansion so that they could raise their family there. So then over the next two years from 2011 to 2013, that is when Blake's mental health really started to go downhill. It was also around these two years where he developed a really bad substance abuse issues such as with alcohol and weed. Due to Eleanor's death, uh, Cody and Blake and Lauren all received an inheritance and so Blake was basically just blowing his entire inheritance on weed and alcohol. In 2013, two years later, Blake actually attempted to remove his father as a trustee 
of his mother's will and deny Cody of his portion of the inheritance. And even though Blake had already inherited a $5.5 million home in Toronto and millions of dollars, he was still trying to take the money away from Lauren and Cody. And so it was said that during this time, Blake would attempt to get back out there career-wise. He, according to his IMBD, tried to make a short film called Soulmates, but that was never produced. Blake was basically just living off of his inheritance from his mother, as well as random checks from side gigs, and would try to think of good show or movie ideas, but a lot of the people that he pitched these ideas to would explain that his ideas were very erratic and too much of everything without considering actual storyline aspects. For example, his very first comic book, uh, The United Worlds one, if you look at like interviews of him at Comic-Con when he's explaining the book, it has dinosaurs, the army, helicopters, outer space, alien, zombies, like it has just every single thing in there. And although all of that sounds interesting, it sounds interesting individually, not all jammed into one thing. Because if you put too much of one thing into a story, it gets very confusing for the reader to the point where they don't even want to read it anymore because you're just adding too much of everything and it's hard to keep up with. Similar to if you were watching Harry Potter and then all of the sudden zombies and the army walked into the storyline. Or if you were watching Star Wars, and they randomly bust out into a musical number. Like, it just wouldn't make sense. One of Blake's friends specifically grew very concerned with Blake, and he felt that he was starting to develop a dark obsession with violence, and the more he started to develop his dark interest and get more emerged in his dark interest, the more he became very distant and paranoid with everyone. In 2015, uh, Amanda, his wife, fell pregnant with their second child, and in the middle of the pregnancy, pregnancy, Blake just up and left Amanda and he left her for a while before he eventually came back and again when his friends saw Blake come back, they noticed a really really scary shift in Blake. It was said that Blake would frequently joke about very dark topics and it wasn't in a like Bo Burnham dark humor sort of way. It was like him joking about extreme graphic gore and violence violence. Not only was he becoming very distant with his friends, he was also becoming very distant with his family. And Blake would always tell people that he couldn't talk to his brother Cody because Cody was in serious debt and owed a bunch of money to a Russian gang member. And if Blake associated himself with Cody, he's scared that the gang members may go after him and his family. Looking into this, I couldn't find anything about Cody being involved in some sort of higher gang society or extreme amounts of debt. And although he didn't talk to Cody, he would talk to his father, Lorne, but the only time he would ever talk to Lorne was to ask for money because he had spent all of his inheritance money and also took out a bunch of credit cards and just racked up all of those credit cards. So all the time he was in serious debt and needed money from his father. Whilst Amanda was still pregnant, that's when Blake started to have an affair with a 30-year-old woman by the name of Yana Kassian. Yana Kassian was born on January 27th of 1986 in Kyiv, Ukraine. And it was there where she studied law and worked as a prosecutor at the Ukrainian tax service, but in 2014, she had moved to California to pursue modeling. During her modeling career though, she was mostly just doing it as a side job to earn extra money, but she was also working on becoming a translator and also working to get her legal license to practice law in the U.S. Now, shortly after Yana and Blake started to have their affair, Amanda found out about the affair, and so Amanda and Blake got divorced. Mid-2015, that is when Blake, again, just being the disgusting human being he is, he 
started to have another affair with a woman named Constance Bugafrieri. Constance was described at the time to be just a co-worker and looking to start a production company together. Shortly after meeting Constance, that is when Blake and Yana found out that Yana was pregnant. Blake was doing the same thing he did to Amanda to Yana. Whilst Amanda was pregnant, he was having an affair with Yana. And now that Yana is pregnant, he's having an affair with Constance. Now, it was said that at first their relationship was not romantic in any way, but in December of 2015, that is when the relationship of Constance and Blake started to become romantic. And Constance started living in one of Blake's Hollywood homes unknowing about Yana or Amanda. On the outside, uh, the couple seemed to be very happy. Yana's mother actually flew in from Ukraine in order to help out the couple with their child and just meet her granddaughter. So on the outside, things seemed to be going very well for the family, but in reality, it was not. Blake, as I said, is a very big narcissist. He feels like the world revolves around him. So when this new baby entered the world, Blake was very angry that Yana wasn't paying as much attention to Blake as she used to be, which is understandable because when you have a newborn child, your whole life as a couple becomes that child. And so Blake felt so entitled to Yana's all the time attention that he would even threaten her multiple times that if she didn't perform sexual acts when he wanted to, or if she didn't pay attention to him enough, then he would leave her for another woman, not knowing that at the time he was already seeing another woman and that woman was Constance. Now, Yana, she felt like arguing all the time in front of the baby was very damaging to the child's mind because when a child is so small and their brain is starting to develop, they definitely hear things and they feel things. And so, so Yana just didn't want all of these arguments and all of this negative energy to be surrounded by her child. So that is when Blake had actually bought an apartment a couple blocks down from their current apartment in West Hollywood and bought the apartment so Yana's mother and their newborn baby could live there for just a couple of weeks while Blake and Yana figured out their relationship. Whilst they were trying to work on their relationship and try to figure out a healthy balance between between parenting life and married life, that is when Blake had gotten arrested right outside his West Hollywood apartment, and it was for a sexual assault charge against Constance Bugafuri. A little bit more of a backstory on Constance. Um, Constance had been living in one of Blake's homes a couple of miles away from his West Hollywood apartment, and as I said, Constance had no clue about Yana or Amanda at the time, and Constance was a very accomplished woman when it came to the film industry. She was a storyboard artist for the movie Aquaman. She worked on big films such as Snow White and the Huntsman and P.S. I Love You. And then on May 20th, that is when Constance went to the police and told police that Blake had forced himself onto her in the house and that Blake and her had been seeing each other for a while. So Blake was arrested for this sexual assault charge, but was unfortunately released after just 15 hours following a $100,000 bail. Since Blake was arrested, Yana knew that he was arrested because he had called her while he was in jail, and so due to him being arrested, that is when Yana found out about the affair with Constance. And once she found out about the affair with Constance, that was her last straw. She just decided to leave. She packed up all her things and she lived with her mother and her baby that was in the apartment a couple blocks away. With Yana leaving Blake instead of Blake leaving Yana, that made Blake very, very angry just because Blake wasn't used to being rejected when it came to women. He was the type of guy that felt like with his money, he could get anything he wanted and that included every girl he wanted and girls would want to stay with him because he had so much money. But Yana was not like that at all. She did not care how much money Blake made. She didn't care how much money 
money Blake wanted to give to her. Yana was the type of girl that viewed love and respect over everything and that included money. She felt like, you know, if you're not gonna love me or if you're not gonna respect me, then I don't wanna be in this relationship. I don't care how much money you're giving me. I don't care how much money you have. I need to be happy and that's all I really care about. And so Yana left Blake, but this made Blake very, very mad because he had never been rejected like this from a girl before. It made him very, very angry to the point where he wanted to make Yana feel just as bad as he was feeling. On May 23rd, three days later, that is when Yana, her mom, and the baby were all out shopping and Yana starts receiving very concerned text messages from Blake because although Yana and Blake are split up, she still has love for Blake, you know, that doesn't just go away overnight. She still cares about him. So whilst they're shopping, she receives these weird texts and she's like, you know what? I'm going to go meet up with Blake at the apartment. We're going to talk about our relationship. And so that is when she says bye to her mother, says bye to her baby, goes off to their West Hollywood apartment to talk things out out. In the following day on May 24th of 2016, that is when Yana and her mom spoke on the phone and the context of this call is unknown, but it did last around seven minutes and after they hung up, that is unfortunately the last time Yana's mom would ever speak to Yana. On May 25th of 2016, the very next day, Yana's mom attempted at calling Yana multiple times, but there was no answer. It always went to voicemail and she started to get very, very worried. So that day at around 1.30 p.m., Yana's mom and her friend went to Yana's apartment building to try to look around and she started looking in the parking garage and she noticed that Yana's car was still in her designated spot, meaning that Yana was still home. So she grew very concerned and worried that something was going on in the apartment. So she went around to the front and she noticed that the balcony doors to Yana and Blake's apartment was wide open. She was yelling at Blake to open the door. She just wants to see Yana. She just wants to talk to her and instead of Blake saying anything to her, he just very slowly walked up to the balcony door and just slid it closed and walked away. Yana's mother later called the police and when the police showed up, they, per usual, did the absolute bare minimum. They knocked on the door but got no answer. Then they also called the home uh, in hopes that Blake would answer, but obviously Blake did not answer the phone, so the police left a voicemail saying, hey, get back to us when you can, Blake, and then they just left. And that was literally it. They could have like interviewed neighbors, they could have looked at security footage, they could have done quite literally anything. On the night of May 25th to the next day, May 26th, all night long, Yana's mother constantly kept on trying to call Yana and text Yana, such as, quote, my dear daughter, please answer me, and, quote, the police are looking for you. They know he has you trapped up there. And another text that read, are you alive? please just answer me, Yana. Clearly, Yana's mother was in very heavy distress. She was very scared for Yana. She was very frustrated that the police weren't trying to do anything to help her. She clearly knew that there was something wrong with Yana. She saw Yana's car in the parking garage, so she knows Yana is home. She knows that she's up in the apartment, but for some reason, no one is trying anything to get inside. So, the very next day at 8 a.m. Uh, Yana's mother goes back to the apartment and that is when she calls the police once again because the police didn't do anything the day before. This time around when the police did show up, they interviewed neighbors and the neighbors said that they hadn't seen anyone come in or out of that apartment in a couple of days. So the police went up there once again and they attempted at knocking on the door. Obviously, there was no answer and the police said that they weren't able to break down the door or 
anything because since there wasn't any alarming noises coming from the inside, they had no real reason to break down the door and get inside. The police basically just did what they did the day before. They called Blake. Once again, obviously, Blake does not pick up because why would he? So they leave a voicemail, a second voicemail, and they're like, oh, sorry, all we can do you know, it's out of our hands, sorry, and then they were gonna leave, until there was this one specific officer by the name of Micah Johnson, he as well had a very deep gut feeling, so he was like the only person that really listened to Yana's mother, and was like, yes, I understand where you're coming from, like, I know this is a very scary situation, and I know that there is a lot that I can do to try to help you, so I am gonna do all of those things, and we are gonna get into that apartment. Micah Johnson got in contact with the landlord of the apartment building and was able to obtain a key for the apartment, so once he obtained that key, he called in backup, and once backup arrived, that is when they all went up to the apartment door, so when they unlocked the door, they noticed that when they pushed the door open, the safety latch was on. So the only way to lock a safety latch is if you are inside of the home. If you've ever seen those type of locks that like kind of swing around to lock it, those are the type of locks you can only do if you're inside. So that's how they knew for a fact Blake was still inside. So the police continued to give multiple warnings to Blake and to Yana to come out, but after hearing no response, they decided to break down the door. Said that upon walking inside, it was very dark and they cleared the living room, dining room, kitchen, and balcony, and there was no sign of anyone. And the only room that they hadn't looked into was the master bedroom, but that door was locked. They were able to open up the bedroom door, but even when the bedroom door was unlocked, they noticed it was barricaded with a mattress, and so they were unable to get inside. The officers continued to yell at whoever was in there to come out, and that is when Blake's voice from the inside shouted back, quote, I'm not going to come out because I'm scared you'll beat me up. The police tried to assure Blake and say, we're not going to touch you. We just want to make sure Yana's okay. And that is when Blake shouts back and says, she's fine. So he continues to tell the police that Yana is actually not there. She's at the hospital and gave the police officers a specific room number in hopes that the police would leave. Blake also told the police that he actually just got off the phone with his dad and his dad was going to be there any minute and he wasn't coming out until his dad got there. When Blake talked about his dad, he wasn't referring to his actual dad, Lorne. He was actually referring to his accountant slash father figure named Stephen Green. Now, a whole month prior to this incident, Stephen Green had been trying to contact Blake for an entire month. He left multiple texts and emails and voice Voicemails. The very last voicemail that Stephen had sent off to Blake was a voicemail of him just saying that he was very worried about Blake and that he loved him and they were going to work together to get Blake some help. Blake did in fact call Stephen Green and Stephen Green shortly showed up at the apartment and when he showed up at the apartment he was immediately met with all of these police officers and detectives and the police officers and detectives did fill him in on the situation. They said that Blake's inside of the bedroom. They believe Yana is in there as well, hopefully alive, but they're not really sure. They're thinking that maybe if Stephen tries to talk to Blake, then Blake will want want to comply and walk out of the bedroom. So at first, Stephen was speaking to Blake through the door, but then later he got on the phone and him and Blake were talking on the phone. After a while of convincing, that is when Blake had complied with Stephen and decided to walk out of the bedroom. And when he did, he was wearing nothing but his boxers. Police immediately ran inside there to go see if Yana was in there. 
and the first police officer that walked in there immediately shouted, she's on the bed. Officers ordered everyone to go outside and ordered the paramedics that were on standby to come upstairs and treat Yana. Yana was taken to the hospital, but unfortunately, it was indeed too late, and at 1.02 p.m., Yana was pronounced dead. Now, usually at this point, I would talk about the interrogation or the crime scene, but I feel like it's very important for you to know the autopsy report. The medical examiners did an autopsy on Yana, and they found that there was bruising on the left side of her face with blunt force trauma to the back of the head. There were also many self-defense wounds found on her body. On her left jaw and left biceps, there were multiple bite marks, as well as fingernail marks found underneath her jaw and her left ear was missing. Also found that her scalp had been cut off and removed from her eyebrows to the back of her head, revealing her skull, as well as a large section of the right side of her face also being removed. There were cuts below her eyebrows, the right side of her face, her cheek, jawline, also cuts surrounding the area of her missing left ear. Medical examiners performing the autopsy said that some of the missing portions they could tell were used with a blade, such as the portion of her head that had been scalped, but in places such as the missing left ear and the large portion of the right side of her face was used not by a blade, but by a hand and force. A really important factor that kind of made medical examiners quite confused was that in Yana's body, half of her blood was completely gone. There was no blood found in her heart, veins, or artery. She was also found with foam in her nostrils, indicating that her head was submerged in water for at least 30 minutes. Based upon other factors that the medical examiners found, they said that it was believed that she was alive and being tortured for an entire eight hours before she had passed away. Her cause of death, as said on the report, was to be draining of the blood. Now that you know the autopsy, let's move on to the crime scene itself. When the police first walked into the crime scene, they found Yana's naked body lying on a clean white sheet and she was covered with a Mickey Mouse blanket and a blue polka dot blanket. There were blood stains and human flesh found hidden behind the bed. There was also blood stains on the wall where Yana was lying. There was also blood stains found on a second bed that was in the bedroom, as well as a side table and two towels. A part of an eyebrow was found on the floor near the bed. There was a clump of hair and blood stained razors in the trash. In the bathroom of the bedroom, there was warm water running in the bathtub, as well as blood stains and clumps of hair found in the drain. A green knife with blood on it found in the top drawer of the bathroom. In the bedroom on the headboard, they actually found very large oval-shaped blood stains, and it was believed that those big oval-shaped blood stains that were on the white headboard was from Yana's scalped head. So that's what they found in the bedroom and the bathroom of the bedroom. But as I said, when the police first walked into the home, the kitchen, dining room, and living room seemed to be very clean. They cleared the area, thought that possibly the place maybe looked a little too clean. They turned off all the lights, turned on their black lights, and that is when the whole apartment just lit up. There were large blood stains that looked to be cleaned up found in the floors of the hallway, the dining room, the guest bathroom, and the guest bedroom, as well as large blood stains found in the kitchen garbage disposal. They checked the dumpster of the apartment building and it was in the dumpster where they found blood stained bedding with bloody handprints all over it towels, clothes, bath mats, a bed skirt, human tissue, scalped hair, and Yana's missing left ear. 
So that was the crime scene and the autopsy. So that is when Blake was arrested and called into questioning. They took samples of Blake's hands and fingernails and found Yana's DNA all over them. They also took Blake's photo from his mugshot and as you can see from his mugshot, he has very intense bruises and scratches all over his face, indicating that Yana was trying to fight for her life while Blake was doing whatever unimaginable things he was doing to her. Blake was also tested for drugs and they only found a small amount of weed, meaning that he was completely sober through all of this. It was described that Blake the whole time during questioning remained ice cold and even pretended as if he didn't know that Yana was dead and when they told Blake that Yana was dead, he just replied with, quote, well, I guess you'll have to find out who did it then. Through security footage, it was also shown that Blake actually used Yana's phone twice to order Postmates. After descalping Yana, taking off her ear, taking off the right side of her face, her flesh was found all over the bedroom. After doing all of that, Blake was still able to order and eat food. It was no doubt that Blake did the crime, but Blake's defense team tried to argue that it was due to reasons of insanity, so he was not guilty. So in 2017, whilst awaiting trial, Blake had told Stephen Green to sell his house, the house that Constance was living in, and give all of the money that he made off of the house to Amanda and his family. Now, since Constance was living there, Constance grew very, very angry with both Stephen and and Amanda. And so then on December 8th of 2017, Constance actually wrote an email saying, quote, I am ready to put a bullet through Stephen Green's head. And through the rest of December, she had sent over 200 threatening messages to Amanda saying that someone was going to find Stephen's dead body on their doorstep one day. Constance later had restraining orders filed against her by Amanda and Stephen Green. Both Amanda and Stephen claimed that Constance was constantly stalking and harassing them for a very long time. She had broken her restraining order and she was sentenced to three years and eight months. She was later diagnosed with a form of schizophrenia, a sleeping disorder, and an alcohol abuse problem. So instead of going to jail for three years, she was placed in a mental health program, and from what I can see, now she is sober, and she lives a very quiet and private life. On June 26th of 2018, that is when Blake's trial began. His defense attempted to argue reasons of insanity sanity, but it took the jury only three hours to come to a guilty verdict and sentenced Blake to life in prison without possibility of parole. He was also ordered to pay $43 million to Yana's family. Blake's brother Cody was present every day during Blake's trial, although his father Lorne didn't show up once. At trial, after talking about all of the horrific things that was found on Yana and and what Blake had done to Yana. It was believed that after comparing specific scenes from his book Syndrome, he was actually trying to recreate specific scenes of the book Syndrome. A specific part of the novel shows a naked woman hanging upside down and being drained of her blood, similar to what was found in the autopsy, that the reason of Yana's death was due to draining of blood. There was also another scene of the the book where a naked woman's body was lying on the bed with no head and that was similar to how Yana was found as well when she had no scalp. Since Blake was pleading not guilty for reasons of insanity, he never gave a full story of what actually happened that night. From the crime scene and the autopsy, they were able to put together a general picture of what they believe happened. It was believed that all of Blake's life, even when he had no talent, no jobs, and no name for himself, he always had money. 
He used his money to get every girl he wanted, any house he wanted, and he kept many girls around in his dating life due to his amount of money. Yana wasn't with Blake for his money. Yana was with Blake because she genuinely did love Blake. She didn't care about how much money he had. All she wanted was love and respect over all of the money in the world. So when Yana left Blake, this made Blake very, very angry and wanted to hurt Yana in the worst way possible. It was believed that since Blake knew how much of a caring person Yana was, he felt like if he sent very concerning text messages to Yana, then that could get her over to the apartment. And so that's what he did. He sent over concerning text messages, knowing that with Yana's big heart, she would feel bad for him and go back to the apartment and that's exactly what she did. It's very unknown why Blake waited till the next day to do anything to Yana and he waited the entire night because as I said the next day she spoke on the phone with her mother for seven minutes so it's very unclear why Blake waited to commit the crime and it was believed that the very next day that is when Blake decided to fulfill his dark and twisted fantasies of draining, torturing, and murdering someone completely sober for the sake of his own entertainment out of something from his comic book. So from the crime scene, it was believed that at first, Yana was putting up a struggle due to her defensive wounds and all of the bruises and scratches found on Blake, that she was hung upside down in the bathroom over the bathtub with the warm water running, so all of the blood that came out of her body would go just straight down the drain. It was also believed from the autopsy how I said that her nose had been filled with foam, meaning that she was probably submerged underwater for about 30 minutes. It was believed that Blake took the shower head and started to submerge Yana's head with warm water to prevent any blood clots from forming, so all of the blood completely flowed out out of her body and into the bathtub. He lied her down on the bed and that is when it's believed he had removed her ear, her right side of her face, as well as de-scalping her. And they believe he de-scalped her on the bed because there was a piece of her eyebrow found on the floor, as well as the oval-shaped blood stains found on the headboard. The following day, that is when Yana's mom showed up and started yelling at Blake through the balcony door, and so he shut the door, and that's when he saw the police show up and he barricaded himself in the room. So for the next two days, he just had Yana's body lying in the bedroom completely drained of her blood and scalped and that is when he had ordered Postmates twice in order to feed himself. He still continues to have no remorse for what he did. He actually brags about what he did in prison. He's very proud of his crime. He believes that it took a lot of strength and knowledge to do what he did and pull it off the way that he did. As as for the aftermath of all of this, Blake still sits in prison to this day and he will sit in there till the day he dies with no possibility of parole. As far as Yana's mother and Yana's daughter, Yana's mother currently lives in the Ukraine where she raises Blake and Yana's daughter. Yana's body was transported from California to the Ukraine and buried in the Ukraine to be closer to her family and friends. As far as Cody, Cody Libel, he lives a very private life today. There's not really much about him as far as the media and even today a lot of people still try to interview him, which in that situation, what is there to really say if your brother committed a horrific and terrifying and graphic and inhumane crime like that? what is there to even say? What is there to even talk about? So as far as today, Cody lives a very private life. I believe he still does real estate, but he goes by a different name when doing real estate. And I just, I feel so, so terrible for Yana's mother and Yana's family and her daughter that now has to grow up without both of her parents. And I feel like Yana was just such 
a beautiful soul. It's just such a horrific thing to imagine and I hope nothing but peace to her family. I hope that they are doing better now. I hope Yana's daughter grows up to know who Yana was when she was on earth, not how she left earth. She really was such a wonderful person, an accomplished woman. You know, she went to law school in the Ukraine. She was currently working on getting her license to practice law in the States. She was hardworking, she was loving, she was caring, and she was just gone way, way too soon. That is the end of today's episode. If you guys found this interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you're on YouTube or if you're on Spotify or Apple or wherever you can find podcasts, make sure to rate it five stars because it really does help me out a lot. As far as this setup, I do plan on fixing it up a little bit. If you guys have any suggestions on what I should do with this area, leave that in the comments below. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. That is all from me. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to be safe out there, drink some water, read a good book, take care of yourself today, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.